friend and sponsor is squishy. I'm just going to weep my way through this one, I can tell. Hi, y'all. My name is Jennifer Huddleston Kelly, and I am an alcoholic. I've been kept sober since December 5th of 92, and that's my miracle, and I'm a, uh, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm all over the place. I'm so thankful to be here with you. Um, I got to come to one and two, and then I prayed for y'all, <laughs> and now I get to be back, and I just feel like it's a big reunion, um, because I have so many people that are, are now my friends, and that I love, and some people that I sponsor, and Please tell Tabitha that that is the best hospitality suite I've ever seen in my life. Um, My sweet little Tabitha, I sponsored a little gal, and she got a stomach bug, and so she couldn't make it. But maybe she'll feel better, maybe. Anyway, Big Daddy got one, too, and uh, I felt terrible leaving. I mean, I I did. Um, So he sends his best. I mean, I really did. I was having a hard time because he was barfing everywhere. And uh, and I said, it's in the vows. And he said, what are you going to do, hold my hair? And so uh, so Big Daddy sends his best, and, and that's me. So, um, he, he actually said he was feeling better. It is an honor and a privilege to get to participate in a, in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's especially special to get to be here with you. Um, I, Don just wrecked me during that meeting. Did, was that awesome or what? So good. So good. And I can't wait because I'm going to do this thing, and then the rest of the weekend I just get to be here, and that's my favorite part. Um, kind of like sneaking in the driveway, drive in in the trunk, you know? I got him real cool like. Um, I'm supposed to tell you in a general way what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now, and let me just tell you. I don't know how this is going to go. I never know how this is going to go, but I really don't know how this is going to go. Um, Fun fact, did you know that before, when a caterpillar turns into a butterfly, in between, when it's in the cocoon, it turns into a bunch of goo so that it gets rearranged into what it's going to be? I'm kind of right there. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying I'm not what I was and I'm not what I'm going to be. So I'm kind of in this in-between. Uh, 2022 has made me miss 2020, <laughs> and um, <laughs> which is saying something. But what I do know is that it's, it's a transformative experience, and I'm, I'm not what I was, and I'm not what I'm going to be. And if you're in that spot, if you're not feeling put together or as grateful as you ought to be, go for you. <laughs> um, see what I did there? Um, then God's got you right where he wants you. And from the beginning of my sobriety, God has brought me to these kinds of things so that I could sit in his lap and hear what I need to hear and do what I need to do. And this has always been spiritual vitamin infusion. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's vacation. You know, I always thought it was like, fun girls weekend. Woo-hoo. No, it means I'm going to cry in a strange place. You know, um, <laughs> something random is going to happen and I'm going to break open some big feelings. Or maybe not, you know, but, um, but, but God has often used these weekends to, to get my attention. Um, so that I have what I need to do, what needs to be done when I return back home. And so um, if you're not feeling like you think you're supposed to be feeling, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> this is Alcoholics Anonymous. We, just, we come as we are. <laughs> it's a spiritual potluck. And, um, <laughs> and you bring what you got. And, um, and if what you got is an empty dish, bring it. And we'll fill it up. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you in a general way, probably not what I was like, what happened and what I'm like now. And, um, and I always start my story in the same way because it's the only way I know how to start it. I stole it from a guy in Fort Worth. I was born at a very early age on November 16th of 1966. I was born to a football coach and an English teacher, and my parents were not alcoholic. They were not drug addicts. They, they're boring. God, they were so boring. <laughs> 
my parents met, they dated, they got married, and they had sex in that order. And, um, <laughs> and in that order is a big deal in my family. In that order is a real big deal in that, oh, big deal. We get married and we stay married on purpose, you know. Um, <laughs> It's a lifetime sentence, y'all. And, um, and I was happy and healthy and well-adjusted for almost three whole years. We got pictures. And, um, and they brought home a bouncing baby resentment. <laughs> and she ruined everything. Um, she ruined any opportunity I might have to blame my alcoholism on my upbringing. It really doesn't do any good to blame your alcoholism on your upbringing. Um, but, I mean, she ruined it because we went to the same schools, we went to the same church, we were potty trained in basically the same way, and we turned out real different. Um, she went to high school and graduated. She went to college and graduated in four years. Um, I'm 55, and I'm a sophomore. <laughs> I have been a sophomore for eons. I'm going to die a sophomore, I'm pretty sure. Um but God's got tricks, so who knows? Um, when my sister uh, graduated from college, she chose a career. She went to work for Jesus in Bulgaria. My sister was a missionary. I was a cocktail waitress in a pool hall. <laughs> so we were both doing God's work in our own way. Um, with the poor and the downtrodden. I was bringing them home. <laughs> And she was handing them Jesus comic books. Um, true story, my sister went to Daytona Bike Week to pass out Jesus comic books. Can you imagine? Anyway, um, so while my sister was in Bulgaria, she met a Bulgarian man. They met, they dated, they got married, and they had sex. In that order. <laughs> I met Big Daddy, uh, well, I met him in high school, but we got married like 12 years ago, and I was not a virgin. So one of these things just doesn't belong here. Now, if you're new, I want to clarify. I'm going to talk about people and places and situations, and a lot of times, especially in my first couple of years of sobriety, I listened to those people and places and situations, and I thought we were explaining why we were alcoholic. And let me assure you, the people and places and situations are not what make me alcoholic. I am almost exclusively alcoholic because of alcohol. It is real hard to make an alcoholic without it. And, um, and I have come to believe, at least for myself, that if baby Jennifer had been born into any family anywhere on the planet Earth and she had found some fermented fruit juice, you would have an alcoholic. All these other things, they're the props that I drank at. But they're not what made me an alcoholic. Because I drank on good days and I drank on bad days. I drank on the days when everything went my way. And I drank on the days when nothing went my way. I drank when I had a boyfriend and when I didn't have a boyfriend. I drank when I was in big trouble and when there was no trouble. So the outside stuff has nothing to do with why I drink. Or how I drink, frankly. What happens to me is that I put it in my body and I can't predict what's going to happen to me. And that's what makes me an alcoholic. And I didn't know that for a long time. I didn't know that sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was telling other people I was an alcoholic because I'd gotten in a lot of trouble. I'd taken a little test that assured me I was alcoholic. I mean, you lie and they say you didn't pass it. It's really offensive. <laughs> that The deck is stacked on those questions is all I'm saying. Because I argued with them about it. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, the reason I'm alcoholic is, is because alcohol does something in me that it doesn't do in 9 out of 10 drinkers. It does something different in me. But let's get back to our story. And why do we tell this part? Because this is where we connect. And when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was connected to no one and nothing except my brain, my thoughts, and my beliefs. And then I heard somebody talk, and they talked about the way that I felt, the places I'd been, the things that I'd done, and the stuff that I wasn't telling anybody. And they were sitting in a room, looking eyeball to eyeball, talking about that stuff. And there was power in that, because something allowed them 
to be able to share that without shame, and I couldn't. But I knew they knew. That's why we tell this part of the story. So I'm growing up in this family that does not drink. What we do is we go to work and we go to church. And uh, and we do the right thing even when nobody's looking. Well, everybody except baby Jennifer. (laughs) Because baby Jennifer started stealing as soon as she had pockets. I mean, on the little Oshkoshes. You know, I mean, if they didn't want you to take the gum, why would they put it that low? (laughs) And she started lying as soon as she could talk. And, uh, and I just always was that way. I don't know why. I just was. And, um, and so I'm growing up in this family, and, and, and I, don't, I don't know why I was a weirdo. I just was a weirdo. I was always up in my head. I was always so afraid. I, I wanted desperately to, to be one of you, and I didn't, I didn't know how. I just I knew from the beginning I wasn't as good as you. Now, nobody ever told me that. But you don't have to tell somebody like me. I'm walking through the world evaluating things. I know exactly who the prettiest girl is. I know who the smartest guy is. I know all those things. And I'm constantly measuring, and I already know in kindergarten that I do not match up. In first grade, they set us in in alcoholic order. No. No, they did not. They set us in alphabetical order. Alcoholical order comes later. <laughs> um, and I sat behind Ken- Kimberly Harris, and Kimberly Harris was beautiful. And she had blonde hair, and she giggled, and she was soft. It was like a little white bunny had come to life. <laughs> she was Kimberly Harris. And Kimberly Harris would tell, she had those curls, those magical pink foam curls. I do not have that. I have just a bunch of cow licks. I, I, I wore like denim leisure suits. It was a very weird time in the 70s. And Kimberly Harris, for show and tell, would talk about her parents who had died in a car wreck. But she didn't say, my parents died in a car wreck. She said, my parents are angels. And I thought, well, of course they are, Kimberly. And in first grade, I know I'm never going to, I'm never going to stack up to girls like Kimberly. And that's how I'm walking through the world, just measuring me by you. I'm just measuring me by you, and I'm never going to be good enough. Never, ever, ever. I'm always going to be big and weird and awkward. And so I learned to be funny. (laughs) Because I'm pretty sure if I'm not funny, nobody's even going to know I exist. I am so dramatically average, it's just breathtaking. And, um... And so I learned to be funny because my brain is eating my face off all the time. And so <laughs> I've got to figure out how to cover for that, you know. And so I, I start putting on costumes, and I wore Converse before anybody wore Converse. I called them my happy shoes, and I had a song about them. It was awkward. And, um, and man, did I like boys. Whoo, I like boys hard. Um... <laughs> But I scare the fish. Uh, I hit puberty in like third grade, and boys discovered me in 2007. <laughs> so most of my life was like, I'm Wiley Coyote, and boys is the road runner, all of them. And um, anybody who's standing still, I have no interest in it at all. And so my story begins with a boy. Um, I I don't really want to tell this, but anyway. So I was about 16, and I was real into Jesus. Uh, I had decided that I would be a minister when I grew up, because I really liked church. We're Methodists, so there's not really anything very offensive. We don't talk about the offensive stuff. Uh, Just be moderate, and let's, you know, the two girls are roommates. And um, we just kind of move on. And... um, they're good old Methodist roommates. And anyway, <laughs> would you believe I don't plan out my talk before I give it? Um, so anyway, so I like the church, and I don't have a God that's scary or anything like that. And and I and there's a lot of attention to get at church, and attention is my drug of choice. And um, and I can pray in public, and there's potlucks and uh, figure-flattering robes, and so I think <laughs> I should be a minister. And um, But then he moved to town, 
he moved to town from Mississippi, and uh, he came walking into the First Methodist Church, and I, I wanted what he had, and I was willing to go to almost any lengths to get it. Mm-mm-mm. He was cute, and um, and he found me fascinating, too, and uh, and suddenly I start thinking, before I've even had a drink, I got alcoholic, and what I think is, if I'm going to spend the rest of my life talking about sin, I should try some. <laughs> and I decide that he's going to be my introduction to sin, and because um, really it's my virginity that's holding me back, and um, and I know that if we have sex, we got to get married. It's in the rules. <laughs> Nobody knows this rule but me. Um, but I've decided I, he's going to deflower me. Now, I don't tell him this. Because I've noticed if you tell a man a plan, he starts to revise the plan. And, um, <laughs> and so we began to date. And we hated the same people. And we were disillusioned by the same things. And we both loved to shoplift. So I knew we would live happily ever after. <laughs> We wore the same size. It was magical. And um, and so one night we went on this very romantical date, and we had done a little light shoplifting at the mall, and we were headed off to a romantic bistro, Chili's. And, um, and I was driving the car because that's what I do. I'm a helper. And uh, something like Lionel Richie was playing or REO Speedwagon set the mood and so I pulled off into a dark parking lot prepared to make my big move I don't know what I'm doing but I've seen some Molly Ringwald movies and um and that's the moment he popped right out of the closet and um (laughs) it's hilarious um because that's the beginning of a pattern um And I, I don't know if there's a fun time from a guy, for a guy from the South to come out of the closet, but I know the early 80s was not it. And, um, and he was terrified, and he trusted me. And yet I was so selfish and self-centered that I made that whole thing about me. Um, I did not act or react well. I did not respond in a loving manner. As a matter of fact, I spent the next two years trying to convince him he wasn't that gay. Um... <laughs> My conversion therapy did not work. Um, He's still gay. Um, I checked. (laughs) Because I was single for a long time. Um, And open-minded. Anyhow, so... um, So I got mad at him, and I got mad at God, and I got drunk. And uh, Because I figure if being on the God squad and doing the right thing doesn't get you what you want, what's the point? And so, uh, and so I decided that I would drink. Now, I'd become fascinated by drinking. My friends started drinking in middle school, but I was not interested in middle school drinking. I don't know if y'all remember middle school drinking, but it involves nose puking and being grounded forever. And, um, and I could get grounded forever all by myself. Nose puking isn't a big selling point. Um, and so I didn't drink, um. But as I got a little bit older, I got around an older crowd, as we tend to do. Alcoholics love to tell about how I started running with an older crowd. It's always because we think we're so mature. (laughs) No. I have the antennas to find the most immature person in any setting and immediately gravitate towards them. And my immature people were a pop group at the First Methodist Church. Um... They were going to the community college, which today I find quite admirable, but um, living at home with mom and dad and singing in the pop group. And they were short one alto, and I happened to be a short alto, and so they invited me to sing along, and, uh, and after choir practice, they would go to the Chili's and have margaritas. And uh, they weren't alcoholic. They had frozen margaritas. And... Um, <laughs> But I'm watching these nerds drinking frozen margaritas, and something happens. Like something magical happens while they're drinking these margaritas. These nerds get personalities. Like all of a sudden, they can tell dirty jokes and flirt. 
and I need to know about this margarita situation. Now you got me interested because I am made up roughly of 75% personality and 25% carbs. And, um, <laughs> and I figure if we can enhance my personality, there'll be no stopping me. The book calls this an ominous warning, but I failed to heed. <laughs> And so I become fascinated by drinking, and I haven't even had a sip yet. But I, I need to know things. I'm a big researcher. I like to know stuff before I do stuff. And children, once upon a time, there was no Google. You just had to go to your friends and ask them. And you know your friends are dumb, but you, they're, what you, they're what you got, you know? And, um, and so I go to my friends, and I ask them about 225 questions about drinking. I exhaust them, and finally, to shut me up. This gal gave me two bottles of wine left over from a party. I don't even know how you have a party and have two bottles of wine left over. But anyway, I can to this day, I can tell you, it was Boone's Farm Tickle Pink and Real Sangria. I'm telling you. Um, I put those two bottles of wine in the back of my dad's cutlass, and I drove them around for a while. He did not check the trunk, by the way. And Boone's Farm Tickle Pink and Real Sangria... It's wine that's never seen a grape. It's not delicious stuff. Um, but let me tell you what makes it even better. Drive it around in some Texas heat and let it roll around a bit. It takes on a bit of a meaty quality. I can't fully explain it. But those of you who have experienced it know what I'm saying here. It's full-bodied. Anyway, so I'm driving around with this wine in the back of my car, and I'm looking for the perfect place to get drunk, and I can't get drunk at my parents' house because they're teachers. They know. They don't even pretend their precious angel wouldn't. They know their angel would. And so i got to find the right place to get drunk. And so it's the night before a church trip. We're spending the night at Yolanda's house. Susie is there, and I am anxious. Um, Yolanda's fighting with her boyfriend on the phone back when phones were on walls. She is no fun at all. And that's when I remember the two bottles of wine. And I asked my friend Susie if she'd like to get drunk, and she would. Now, Susie was a teeny tiny drill teamy girl. I don't know if y'all have those here, but we've got lots of them in Texas. And she's just a teeny tiny. She still is a teeny tiny drill team. She's 55 freaking years old. And she's got this gorgeous blonde hair, naturally curly, of course. Ugh. And just huge these and a teeny tiny this and woo, you know, and just pom poms for days. And um and she can do the splits for no reason. <laughs> and I don't know if you can tell, but I've had to do a lot of writing about girls like Susie. <laughs> Because girls like Susie say, I'm cold, and everybody's leaping over furniture to change the thermostat and grab blankets. Jennifer, chop some wood. Susie's cold. <laughs> and I'm that chick out in the parking lot changing her own tire, you know, because I'm a sturdy girl. And, um, and it's not until years later in Alcoholics Anonymous that I'm doing an inventory and I discovered that the reason I'm that girl who changes her own tire is that I'm so certain that no one would ever help that I've never given them the opportunity. I'm so sure nobody will ever ask me out that I never listen hard enough to hear that they did. I'm so sure they won't open the door. I grab it before anybody has the opportunity. No one treats me like a lady because I don't believe I'm a lady. My beliefs are creating my reality. But I don't know that. And so I have this problem. I've got this girl that I absolutely love. She is the kindest woman I've ever met in my life. She is still my friend today. And I hate her guts. Because <laughs> I'm so freaking jealous. And all I know is that I want to be better at drinking than Susie. I just want to beat her at something. And so we began to drink. And something happened to me that didn't happen to Susie. If you ask Susie what hap happened that night, she will talk about blood and urine and vomit and... DNA, just a lot of DNA. <laughs> and I'm not saying those things didn't happen. I'm saying, why would you focus on that part? <laughs> because for me, we laughed and we talked and we wet our pants and we puked. It was glorious. <laughs> see, something happened for me that didn't happen for Susie. It changed my reality. Because you see, when we started drinking, Susie didn't know that I was down here and Susie was up here. Susie didn't know 
that as we drank, we were neck and neck, one bottle in. Susie didn't know that as I drank that second bottle, I could take her at anything, including doing the splits. (laughs) And if drinking made you feel like it made me feel, well, I guess you'd be here, wouldn't you? (laughs) And so I drank. Now, that next morning was not anything to be bragging about. That next morning I came to and it tasted like a hamster had slept in my mouth. Do you remember that? You would wake up and your tongue had grown hair. It was so weird. I headed downstairs. I drank a bunch of water because I had never been that thirsty in my life. Heading downstairs, my stomach turned into a lava lamp. We got downstairs. I, I was at a Hispanic girl's house. Her mother made huevos rancheros for breakfast. And so I puked again, and then I got on a bus to go sing for Jesus. And uh, and I was both of those things, and I loved both of those things. And my book tells me right here I could quit, but why? I loved how it made me feel. And if all that it did for, all I had to pay was, you know, some vomit and disappointment. <laughs> I could get new friends. You know, I'm uh, sign me up. I'll take a lifetime membership. That's where my drinking career began. Where it ended, I pray, was there were jobs and no jobs, men and no men, utilities and no utilities. I like to say that I, um, I wasn't promiscuous. I just slept with a lot of people. <laughs> I kind of wish it was lust, but that's not the truth. Uh, the truth was that um, I didn't drink at home, and I didn't drink alone, and it wasn't until I went through the book Alcoholics Anonymous with a sponsor and compared notes with my sponsor that I realized why I didn't drink at home and why I didn't drink alone. When I was 19 years old, one of my high school friends went to the same college that I went to. He got drunk that night just like I did, and he went home, and he passed out on his back, and he asphyxiated on his own vomit, and he died. And I went to his funeral. It's the last funeral I went to until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And sitting in his funeral, I knew I was that kind of drunk. I knew I was that kind of drunk. I would have been offended if you called me an alcoholic, and yet I knew that kind of thing could happen to a drunk like me. And so I made the decision that I couldn't drink at home and I couldn't drink alone. But what that meant was that if I wasn't done drinking when the bar shut down, I needed to go with somebody else. And it meant that I turned my will and my life over to the care of anybody who would have it. I hate admitting that. I hate that that's the kind of person I became. I hate that that's where alcoholism took me, but it's pretty important for me to admit that I'm trading my body for a beer. I would have been offended if you called me a prostitute. I wasn't smart enough to make any money. (laughs) A couple of curs light and I'm good to go, you know. um, (laughs) What I turn into is somebody who's drunk absolutely every single day. I'm drunk whether I want to be or not. I'm drunk whether it's a good idea or not. I have a job because I have to have a job. And by day, I'm often a preschool teacher, (laughs) which is great, except for all them kids. Um, (laughs) Man, they are loud and not big on the boundaries. (laughs) Miss Jennifer, Miss Jennifer, Miss Jennifer. Miss Jennifer's detoxing. (laughs) We're going to be quiet. We're going to paste. Eat the paste, paste each other. I don't really care. (laughs) But eventually, you know, the daycare kind of gets real rigid about wanting me there all day, every day, fully dressed, ready to function. And so I'd switch, and I'd I'd go work at the pool hall or at the bar, and and then the the bar situation would just get out of hand because there was no there's no bumpers, you know, there was no limits, and uh and I start getting DWIs because that's a hobby of mine. I got one, and and uh, then I got a second one in less than six months. I was shocked. Uh, couldn't even believe it because I had a solid plan. I was going to be more careful, and. Um, <laughs> That plan didn't work out so hot. Um, but in between, after that second DWI, I got a much more solid plan because I got that alkalogic. I decided to move next door to my favorite bar. <laughs> Problem solved. 
I don't know that I have alcoholism and it's fatal and it's progressive and, um, and that wherever I go, there I am and I'm bringing alcoholism with me. And I don't have to acknowledge it. I don't have to recognize it. I don't have to admit it to die from it. And gradually things get worse. The last year of my drinking, I moved home with my mom and dad. I had gotten engaged. I, getting engaged was sort of a thing with me. Um, and I, when I say engaged, I don't necessarily mean he went to Jared. <laughs> He most certainly did not. Um, I don't really require that kind of attention to detail. If he was half in the bag and in a blackout and said, you know what we ought to do? I said, yes, and started practicing calligraphy because I was absolutely certain if I could just get married and have me a little redheaded baby, I, I wouldn't be doing this stuff. I just, I truly believe that, you know, if somebody loved me enough, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this. Now, I don't know where I thought I was going to get that superpower because I drank with women who brought their baby carriers into the pool hall and set it right on the pool table so that they could drink. But the story I told myself was that if somebody loved me enough or I loved somebody enough, then I wouldn't be doing what I was doing. And gradually things got worse. That last guy, man, he was, he was, he hung hard. I mean, he tried so hard to stay. He had an alcoholic mama. He had been trained. Um, He was looking for a higher power and I was looking to be one. I mean, we had some real potential. Um, I'd throw all his stuff out and kick him out and he'd leave and then I'd chase him around the block and I'd tell him to get back in there and he'd come back. It was magical. I used to say we had a love so big we'd have to take it outside. (laughs) He did go into the Navy to get away from me. And then he forgot what a jerk I was, and I forgot what a jerk he was, and we got engaged, and I thought ship to shore. It was magical. And uh, there was only one problem. We were alcoholics. And so he kept getting thrown in the brig, and I kept forgetting to be faithful. And um, <laughs> and, um, and eventually we had called off that wedding and rescheduled it several times, which was making my little Baptist grandma insane. And, um, and I just surrendered and said, this isn't going to work. And, um, and I moved back home with my mom and dad. And for the last year of my drinking, I was, uh, I was living in their house. And they were getting up, and they were going to work, and they were going to church. And their daughter was running in at 2 and 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, bouncing off their cabinets, eating their food, stealing out of their wallets. She was turning gray. She no longer laughed. She no longer sang. She just barked at people and cried. And they were held hostage by their fear. They never said a word about it. They never said a word Because they were so afraid that if they said something, that I would leave and they wouldn't know that I was okay. For some reason, they thought if if I was just under their roof, maybe, just maybe, they could keep me safe. And gradually, things got worse. On November 19th of 1992, I scored a felony DWI. Uh, Got any felons in the room? (laughs) Anyway... um, I once went on a job interview, and and I said, well, I'm a felon. And she said, you don't look like a felon. (laughs) I said, I know a bunch of felons look just like me. Um, Anyway, so I got a felony DWI. And and the only thing that was different that night was something weird happened. I got pulled over, and um, that's not weird. But uh, the cop asked me how much I'd had to drink. Everyone in this room knows the correct answer to that question. A gobble. I've said it a million times. Do you know what I said? $67 worth. And y'all, this, this was 1992 money. I was not drinking $12 cocktails, okay? $67 worth. Go to jail, go directly to jail. Uh, do not pass go, do not collect nothing. And, um... And so I, they took me to jail that night, and, and the only thing that was different was that I told the truth. And I had a moment of clarity sitting in a jail cell, and, the, and that moment of clarity, that moment of grace, was that I saw myself exactly as I was in that moment. That's it. I knew, I knew exactly what I was. I knew, I knew 
It wasn't, I don't drink because of situations. I drink because of air. You know, I had already gone to outpatient treatment. I didn't, I swear to y'all, I went to outpatient treatment, didn't know we weren't supposed to drink. I swear it. I was in the group and they said, oh, Jose relapsed. I said, what's relapse? He drank. I'm thinking, shoot, I drink every night. What are you talking about? (laughs) We're not supposed to drink. I didn't sign that paper. Um, Anyway, um, they told me I was a people pleaser and I recovered from that. I ain't pleased nobody in a long time. And um, so anyway, um, now I lost my train, and it was a short train to start with. So I'm in the jail cell. That's where I am. I'm in the jail cell. I have a moment of clarity, and I know that I will drink again. If you let me out of there, I'll drink again. I just, I know it's a bad idea. I know it's wrecking everything that comes into my life. I am absolutely certain that nothing good will be able to come into my life and stay if I continue what I'm doing. And yet I know if they let me out of that jail cell, I'm going to drink again. I can't promise me, God, or anybody else that I won't do it again because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I will. What makes me feel halfway human makes me a danger to myself and to others. And I can't promise anybody that I won't do it again because I'm absolutely certain that I will. And I surrendered in that jail cell and I asked God for help and I meant it. I made a decision to go to Alcoholics Anonymous and I meant it. And then they opened the door. And when they opened the door, I made a really bad mistake. I didn't run to Alcoholics Anonymous. I tried to cover up the mess. But then I was the assistant director of the daycare. (laughs) Even in the worst of my drinking, people liked me and they wanted to give me opportunities. And they were trying to make my life better. And I was in trouble because I forgot to open the daycare when I was locked up in jail. And, uh, and I'm living with my parents, and every attorney in Dallas is sending me mail, and I'm trying to hide that. And I, I mean, it's just a mess. It's just a mess. And I just keep thinking, i got to get my car out of the impound before anybody finds out it's in the impound. And i gotta, I got to get the daycare off my back. And, I, and I'm trying to make bad look good instead of running to you saying I need help. And the longer I wait, the worse Alcoholics Anonymous sounds. I mean, I'm not listening to anybody but my head, but it, that sounded real bad. Because my head comes up with some questions while we're thinking about AA. Like, do they really not drink? Like, all the time? I mean, how do you not drink all the time? I mean, how would you move (laughs) if you can't drink? Does that mean you give up Mexican food? I mean, I'm just sitting around thinking... What if you what if somebody dumps you? I mean, what do you do? There's not enough ice cream on the planet. And I'm just sitting around thinking about what it would be like not to drink. And I'm thinking about this while I'm not drinking. And the longer I don't drink and think about not drinking, the worse not drinking is starting to feel. So I accidentally got drunk. Um I had bought a big book because I started to go to a meeting and then decided I can't be rolling into a meeting without a book. You can, by the way, just in case there's anybody confused, go to the meeting without a book. They'll help you. I left the place where the big books live to go on a quest for a book. And so, uh, (laughs) and then I decided they costed too much at the Barnes and Noble and And like Don was saying, they got them at the half-price books, but willy-nilly highlighting, jacking up the first 23 pages. I can't be buying that book. And um, so I have to go to all these different half-price books to get the book and because I need a clean copy worthy of my study. (laughs) And then I got to read the book by myself. Super helpful. And um, and that's when I got drunk because I start thinking about this not drinking thing that the book seems to focus a lot upon. And... um, and it's, it's really not going well. Like, we're there, and it's not happening for me. And, uh, and I start remembering this guy that I know who's got eight DWIs, and he's still drinking at the bar. I got three DWIs. My attorney's telling me I'm going to do a year in jail. I'm not good at jail, y'all. I am not. I am not tough. 
My weapon of choice is projectile weeping. <laughs> I am a total weenie, and uh, I cannot do jail. And, uh, and I start thinking about this guy who has eight DWIs and is still drinking in my home bar, and I think, here's a man with a real answer. I mean, why would I bother... <laughs> Why would I bother you nice people in Alcoholics Anonymous when clearly Jimmy the Criminals figured something out? And so I decide I'm going to go see my legal advisor, Jimmy the Criminal. And, uh, and if what he suggests to me doesn't work, I could always come see you. So I go to this bar, and I'm not going to drink. I'm not an idiot, y'all. I'm just going to see Jimmy. And they put drinks on the bar when I walked in the door because they always put drinks on the bar when I walk in the door because Jennifer doesn't walk in the bar and go, no, I'm not drinking. Except this one time, no, I'm not drinking. And I sit across from this criminal who I thought was the worst drunk I knew. I know worse ones now. But um, I'm sitting across from this criminal and I start telling him what's going on. And what he says is, oh, Jen, honey, I can, I can afford to be the kind of drunk I am. You can't afford to be the kind of drunk you are. And when the worst drunk you know is talking down to you a little bit, <laughs> you are having a real bad day. I mean, I could have kicked that guy right in the baby maker. Because uh, I can't pass college algebra, but I know eight DWIs is more than three DWIs. And what I learned is that, you know, Jimmy meant he could afford it financially. He was paying his attorney in cocaine. And... Um, <laughs> I didn't happen to have any cocaine, and, uh, and, and Jimmy said that he was going to go to prison, and I wasn't really down to clown with that whole deal. So, um, but Jimmy suggested that maybe this was an opportunity for me to find a new way to live. I know. I could have kicked that guy right in the baby maker. <laughs> and the other thing that happened was at some point there were drinks in front of me. At some point I drank them, and I don't remember drinking them, not because I blacked out that night, but because I didn't make a decision to drink. I had made a decision not to. And yet I picked it up just like it was water. And I looked down and I saw empty glasses. And I knew for sure I drank them, but I don't remember doing it because it's as automatic as breathing air for somebody like me. And I've been telling this story for almost 30 years, and I get chills every time I talk about this point. Because I will drink against my will. I will drink whether I think it's a good idea or not. I will drink whether I want to or not. I will drink whether I intend to or not. An alcoholic drinks. That's what we do. If there is not a power greater than myself, I am doomed. And that's when I became convinced that I was going to have to get some help. And so I dro drove around an AA group, just around and around and around. Any orbiters? Man, I'm a big orbiter. I drove around and around and around and around and around. And on November 19th of 1992, I finally walked through the door. No, I did not. Let's make that December 4th. 19th was when I got the DWI. December 4th, because I know you're keeping up with the dates. It's important. Circle it on your calendar. <laughs> December 4th of 1992, I walked into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that I would sit all the way through. I didn't think I was going to sit all the way through it. God had some plans. I did make a deal with God in the parking lot that I would stay for one whole meeting. And then if I heard something I could hang on to, I would come back for one more. I was not super humble, but I was suicidal-ish. And so I walked in, and I walked into the Plano group of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was um, a little greenhouse. The foundation was funky, so it kind of slanted. But you had to detox before you noticed that. Um, <laughs> I don't know if y'all have groups like that here, but um, this place was the place where furniture goes to die. <laughs> you know, like when Grandma says, let's get rid of that couch, they take it up to the Plano group. And... Um, and everybody in there smoked. The guys on the oxygen tanks were smoking in the meeting. Lots of smoking. Weird pictures. You couldn't move any of them because of the nicotine on the walls. They had them thinker pictures like the three frogs. Which one of them frogs has made a decision? We'll get to that. Anyway, so they torture you with the freaking frog picture. Anyway, um... And so it seemed like the room was this big. In truth, this was a teeny tiny little house. But I sat where the newcomer loves to sit as close to the door as humanly possible. You guys seemed like you were all way down here, and I'm sitting way back there. And they turned out the lights, and they lit the candles, and I knew I was in a cult. <laughs> but it didn't matter because I had nowhere else to go. 
And I'm sitting there by that back door, and right before the meeting started, they said, hey, why don't you come up here? We've got a seat right here. Why don't you come sit with us? And for reasons that I can only explain as God's grace, I got up from the seat that I had chosen, and I joined the circle in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I truly believe that my recovery began when I surrendered my idea and started trying yours, because I haven't had a drink since. Now, I've had to do a few things to keep that seat, but I believe it began the moment I let go of my bright idea and started trying yours, because I became a part of the circle of Alcoholics Anonymous. And man, y'all get tickled when you got a newbie in the room. You get so excited. (laughs) Woo! We got a live one. And oh, man, I wasn't faking anybody out, man. I was just a walking nerve ending, and she was a vision for you. (laughs) I had some sweats that had become my uniform. I had bought them in the men's department of the Walmart. I wore a ball cap. I had short hair. I wore boys' shoes. They did not know what it was. But it wept a lot. Um, And in their defense, it thought it was a lesbian that didn't like women. So we had a lot of step work to do. And I'm sitting there just twitching. I haven't had a drink in about eight days. We're all here, you know. Um, My brain is eating my face off. And you're just so excited to see me. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. We are so glad you're here. You're the most important person here. Because you remind us of where we never want to be again. (laughs) Hashtag rude. I mean, um, bless your hearts. I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't gone to AA orientation. I don't know. The phenomenon of craving. The three legacies. The big book. I don't know what you're saying, but you're real enthusiastic. And the longer you talk and the less I understand, the more afraid I become because it's not like I'm going to raise my hand and say, hey, what are you saying? I don't know what a sponsor is. I don't know what a big book is. I just bought Alcoholics Anonymous at the half price books, but I don't have a big book because I don't know they're the same thing. I don't understand what you're saying. I don't even know what an alcoholic is. I've been trying to read this book by myself, and I don't understand it. And finally, this guy began to share, and he had on a camo fishing cap and a beard down to his belly button, and he was wearing bib overalls, and God knows who he's talking to because i got a thing for bib overalls. I don't know. <laughs> i got a pair that are about this big. They're magical. I think when we get to heaven... They're going to give us bib overalls and some wangs and um, <laughs> maybe some ribs. I don't know, but um, I have some ideas about what heaven's going to be like. But I do know that bib overalls are involved in the uniform. And this guy's name was Gene, and Gene was not a member of the Mensa, but he knew how to talk to a newcomer in a way that a newcomer could hear. And what he said was, I didn't know I was an alcoholic. Hell, I just thought I was thirsty. And my problem is, the more I drink, the thirstier I get. And it begins with the very first drink. And he solved this mystery that I'd been working on for 10 years of daily drinking. I watch people drink, and they have one drink, maybe two. And then they go home. They make a decision, they pay their tab, and they drive home. One drink, maybe two. Oh, look at the time. Mama's got dinner waiting on us. (laughs) And show off, they go right home. I know, because I followed them. And I would think, why would you do that? We have pretzels here. One drink, maybe two. Oh, 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 look at the time. The game's about to start. And that's when I turn into the flight attendant. We have TVs here, here, and here. <laughs> why would you do that? But my question changes over the years to why would you do that to how do you do that? Because I can't do that, and I don't understand why. The decisions I am making are placing myself and others in harm's way, and I can't just stop. No matter how great the necessity or the wish, and Gene explains why, the more I drink, the thirstier I get. It begins with the very first drink. The whole ball game for a drunk like me is how not to take the very first drink. And y'all, I've been watching people online, and, I, and I'm so grateful that we have had Zoom, but let me tell you something. We get to see where the holes in our education are in Alcoholics Anonymous, because there's folks who are saying, I, 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 I drank again. And 25 people go, you got this, girl. 
you got this. And I'm like, no, you do not. The needed power is not here. I cannot stop me from drinking. I've tried a million times. The needed power is not here. But guess what? It's here. And you were my introduction to that power. Sitting in your meetings, your kindness, you spoon-fed me, God. After that first meeting, you told me to go to Denny's, and I went because I thought that's where you filled out the paperwork to join Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went. You, you told me to go. I mean, I went. If you had asked me to go, I would have lied and said, oh, no, no, I've got a board meeting in the morning. But you told me to go, so I went. And I didn't fill out any paperwork, but I do think I went to AA orientation. And I learned that you guys laugh at things that aren't funny. You share things you should not share. (laughs) Especially not in public. We're not that anonymous because you have no volume control. (laughs) And you say stuff like, isn't that just like an alcoholic? (laughs) And I don't know that if you're at Denny's at 2 in the morning, you're either a member of AA or a future member of AA. (laughs) Or, oddly enough, a square dancer. We got them. I don't understand it, but they're often at the Denny's at 2 in the morning. Anyway. But there I saw what I see here, what I see at meetings all over the world. A fellowship of friendliness and an understanding that is indescribably wonderful. And it is so beautiful for someone who has been locked in the prison of alcoholism, isolated by her own selfishness and self-centeredness. That music of you people loving on each other is so beautiful that I do something I haven't done in years. I took a suggestion. I went home and I talked to a God that I knew had given up on me with good reason. I asked for help. I said a prayer. I got up in the morning and I did it again because that's what you told me to do. And I I went to work and I came to the very next meeting because that's what you told me to do. And I walked in the door and a man named Danny walked up to me and he said, Hey, is your name Jennifer? And I said, Why? What have you heard? (laughs) And he said, Is your name Jennifer? And I said, Yeah. And he said, Did you drink today? And I said, No. And he said, Welcome to your second day of sobriety. And he set the hook. And the big deal was not that he knew it was my second day of sobriety. Two days of sobriety meant nothing to me at that time. The big deal was that he remembered my name. And I hope I never forget that. The big deal was that he remembered my name. And I came to meeting after meeting after meeting because you spoon-fed me God. I went to counseling because the state of Texas required it. And coincidentally, the counselor that I went to was a retired minister from my childhood faith. And so as I started to work the steps, I began to balk. All of a sudden, all my religious training comes back, and I'm like, you can't choose your own conception of God. And so I go to tell the minister friend about it, because I need to tell on Alcoholics Anonymous only. Coincidentally, this minister, who is, by the way, about 112 years old, and he has an oxygen tank, and I am a new feral alcoholic, way oversharing. The church was probably not the right place for me. Um, actually, it probably was the perfect place for me. But anyway, um, I tell him, you're not going to believe what those alcoholics are doing. They're saying that you can choose any conception. And he said, isn't it awesome? I love the 12 steps. I'm not one of you guys, but I love them. I think they're the perfect spiritual path. And I believe that there's a power. We call him the Alpha and the Omega. He's everything. And if he's everything, why can't you start wherever you want to? I believe that power wants a relationship with you so desperately that he's willing to come to wherever you are. Just start. You and I, Jennifer, we're mud people. And we meet God in the dirt. Just show up in the dirt and call him something. And that man gave me permission to take that second step. And once I took that second step, I took the third. And once I took the third, well, crap. (laughs) I wasn't willing to leave. And so I kept going. And I took those steps. And little by slow, and I mean really slow, I began to change from the inside out. I found the great reality deep down within. 
the last place I'd ever look for God. And I got so busy with the blessings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and my life got bigger, little by slow. I fell in love with you people. I love sponsorship. Once upon a time, I believed that if I got enough sponsees, they would walk around and they would go, the sponsor has saved my life. <laughs> if I could ever be half the woman, my, you know those sponsees. I don't get those sponsees. I get the little feral guy. Not, not Brenda B. Not Brenda B. Not Tabitha. But I got some who are just... I mean, you know, the wackadoodles. I don't understand. I really keep them on it. I'd like to, I'd like to thank my sponsor for my 12-year chip. No, that's not the one I get. I get the ones just like me. I get the ones just like me. I slip up in a meeting and say, well, yeah, sometimes I shoplift and four girls. <laughs> After the meeting, go, well, I like to steal stuff, too. I mean, I go... I don't want to stop. I just thought that was cool. We had that in common. I'm like, come with me. Let's go. And the funny thing is, I think that they're coming to me so that I can help them. And they're coming to me so that they can help me. See, God sent me a little thief so that we could steal poopery at exactly the same time. <laughs> so that I could surrender stealing. I don't know if she's still stealing or not, but I'm not because it outgrew my, its usefulness and I became willing to trust God instead of taking stuff that doesn't belong to me. You know, God sends me these women and, and they keep throwing me back to God. You know, they're like little flippers on the pinball, you know, and they call you up with their stuff and you... And, uh... And so, um, at the first of this year, my husband and I, we live with my mom. Oh, crap. I just hate telling this stuff because um, it's actually pretty good. But anyway, it got hard. Uh, we lived with my sweet little mother, who is just the nicest, most gener- generous, kind woman ever. And, um, but she was kind of, she's aging. You know, they do that. And, um, and she's getting a little fuzzy mentally and... Um, and she has a little hoarding thing, uh, just a touch of the hoarding. And um, and my husband and I have been looking out for for a while. And um, on January 2nd, we took her to a basketball game. We went to Oklahoma City, and we took her out of town. We got a little Airbnb, and we were going to take her to go see the Mavs play the Oklahoma City thumb, Thunder, just a little overnight trip. And as we were walking in, trip, huh, as we were walking into the stadium, my mom face planted, just, I mean, straight face plant. And uh, we spent a fabulous evening in the ER um, getting mom stitched up. Worst Christmas present ever. Um, and then a week later, she fell coming down the stairs and uh, broke her ankle like Dak Prescott stuff. I don't want to go into it, but it was gross. And... Um, in between that, my husband's gallbladder blew up, and um, two cars broke down. It was, it was just a fantastic time. And, um, and my mom's just been in and out of the hospital. And, um, and along the way, I, um, I had to surrender. Because without realizing it for the last two years, I have single-handedly been keeping my mother alive. Wasn't going well. <laughs> But I was committed to it. And uh, and when she broke her ankle, um, I got the the gurney blocked me out of the house, which was a really good thing because what was going on in the house I couldn't have watched. But um, I surrendered in the driveway, and I said I care more about the quality of my mom's life than the, than the length of it. And I hadn't been willing to make that surrender yet. And so she's been in and out of the hospital, and... Um, and I became the designated adult, which I am wholly unqualified to do. I, um, I'm only 55. <laughs> <laughs> but along the way, I got this squirrely little sponsee. She's just like me. And, um, 
And she needs to work the steps, but we've worked the steps so many times, and she's just, we get to a certain point, and she's just not willing to come clean. And so I think, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trick her. I mean, I'm not above it. And, because uh, she's just like me, she's not that bright. And so I, um, and so I decide we're going to do some writing together, and um, journal writing, because she has responded pretty well to that in the past. And so I say, uh, I tell you what, let's do some writing together. And you do it, and I'll do it, and we'll just see what happens. And, uh, and so the first writing assignment I give her is, uh, God, here's why I don't trust you. <laughs> and so I start writing it, and, um, and I, you know, I spend a page and a half telling God, you know, well, of course I do, obviously. And I kind of give God my resume on how I do trust him. And that's when I discover... I hadn't given him my mom in any way, shape, or form. And, uh, and I've been really afraid at work, and so I was just sort of avoiding doing scary things, which will kill a, a business real quick. And, um, and I just started finding some stuff where I, I was running the show again, and the needed power wasn't there. And I shared the reading with her, and she shared her reading with me, and I gave her the next assignment, and and the next assignment was, what should I call you? And it was a way to explore the second step in a way I hadn't done in a long time. And and I went through all the things I didn't want to, I didn't want to call God, and and I, at the very end, I kind of got down to, um, God is love, and love is God. Why don't I just call you love? And it's amazing how the intimacy of this time that I spend with the power changed when I just started addressing it with love. Because as I am asking these questions about how to respond to life on life's terms and these things I don't know how to do, the question is always, how do I bring love? How do I bring God into this situation? Well, she stopped doing the writing. Shocker. Because <laughs> she's just like me. But I kept going. And at one point, God told me I had to pray for my sister because we, uh, well, we had a conversation that I'm not allowed to have because we see things differently, like religion and politics. And we just got into one tiny little, I made one tiny little joke. <laughs> Uh, that went super left. Uh, and she didn't. <laughs> and uh, and, we, and I wound up back in that spot where I was like, I don't, I don't care if we ever talk again. I'm so tired of this. Why do I always have to be the one to apologize? Why do I always have to be the one with principles? But I'm talking to love in my dumb journal. And love says, you have to apologize because you can. She's been following you her whole life. So you apologize and you start praying for her. And so I apologize and I start praying for her. And y'all, I did nothing else because I wasn't gonna. (laughs) And she starts calling me. And the whole tone of our conversation changes. And y'all, I did nothing but pray for her. I swear on my big book, I did nothing but pray for her. But this happened back in October. And for 40 days, I did this writing, trying to trick somebody else into working the steps. Because God knew what was coming. Because God knew what was coming. And he allowed me to match calamity with serenity, provided I stuck close to him and did his work well. He healed that relationship with my sister because I was going to have to have a partner to do the things that were coming up. He gave me the willingness to see that I can't, but he can. And he gave me a message to share. There's a God, and it's not me. There's a God that loves me so much that he's willing to find me wherever I am. He loves me unconditionally and indescribably and he feels exactly the same way about you you're his favorite he's been pursuing you and the easiest way to find him is sitting knee to knee with another alcoholic reading that book and coming clean 
It's changed my life. And it continues to each day that I let God in by sharing my life with you. I'm glad to be here, and it's a good day to be sober.